Chao. And um, I want to say welcome, everybody. Um, all the captains in the house, my bosses in the house. Uh, special thanks again to Captain Joshua for coming to, to bless us uh, today. We'll call it offering, sir, and uh, we'll send to your ministry. Uh, so it's going to be taking us on um, um, contingency, and today will be the final class on emergency contingency, and how we are going to be answering questions when it deals with emergencies on board, which is uh, a very important um, topic, and of course, um, if real points where examiners determine are you safe to be promoted to a rank or you're not. So with that, I will leave the floor for Captain Joshua. And like I said, today is the rounding up of all emergencies. So as, um, as we are about to end, I would like all questions relating to emergencies. What what we have expected to do, what we the examiner think I should say, let those questions, let it come in. Um, but let Captain Joshua um, bless us uh, today. So with that, uh, I say Captain Joshua, thank you again. And um, you are welcome, sir. And the floor is yours. Uh, good evening, everyone. Good evening, Captain Akolabi, Captain Tyro, Captain Asi, and the rest of Captain Tyro. Okay, uh, we all know that we've discussed uh, about contingency plan. This is the first time. So we've discussed about fire, about man over board. We talked about oil spillage and the rest. So today we'll be talking about about two other types of emergencies that we might have. We'll talk about uh, cargo ships. But before we go in to the explanation on cargo ships, uh, I'd like to remind us about the actions that we have to take whenever we have an emergency. We have four specific actions that need to be taken. The first one, which is what you are supposed to do immediately, the emergency of call, which is the initial or immediate action. This is just to minimize further actions, further uh, incidents. So immediately you have an incident or immediate action. Then we we'll go on to assessment or, or investigative action. So when that is concluded, then we'll move on to the contingency action. Finally, informing informa uh, informa action, so those that need to be informed. So, like I said, Like I said, today we'll be discussing two emergencies. First one is cargo shift. Cargo shift can be caused by anything, a strong current or waves on the side. It can be caused by anything. But during your investigative action, that is where you investigate to find out what really causes it. So when you have cargo ship, the first thing I expect us to do, just like every other uh, uh, every other emergency, you start an alarm. This is to inform everyone on board that there is an emergency. Thereafter, you proceed to reducing your speed, maneuver the vessel, to minimize uh, motion. You can also alter your course so as to reduce the action of wind or wind or the current. So number three, you muster all crew, passengers, 
and check for missing and injured persons personnel on board. <clears throat> Number four, send an urgency or distress message. Close watertight doors, display any useful light, shape, or signal or sound signal. This is to inform all other vessels around that you are in this train. So every other vessel around that is your NUC, they will know that you are not under command. You cannot maintain your force and speed due to what happened to you. So they will have to keep clear for you. And make, make an, uh, an initial report to the office. This is reporting the incident to the office, probably calling your DPA immediately. If you cannot send the mail, like the company I am, there is something we have, uh, we call it a uh, flash. So immediately you have an incident on board, within two hours of that incident, you send a flash. So the flash will include, we, we, we contain incidents that happen, what can cause it, further action that will be taken. You just send one of your captain, I said, or chief mate, I said you could send one of your, of your second mate, giving the details what you want to send. Send the flash immediately. Then later on, when you've done the assessment and everything, you can now later on come down and do an incident report. That is a full detail. When you send the flash, if you need any support from the office, immediately they see the flash, they will know, oh, this has happened on the vessel, and this is the support that you need from them and everything. But if you don't remember to send the flash, you might not get the support from them. So the initial report sent to the office is very, very important. It's key. So thereafter, you move on to the assessment and investigative action. This is where you try to check what really caused the, the uh, cargo ship. So we have the check and the assessment. So the first thing is the check. So you check the vessel position in relation to traffic density, every weather, and close proximity to shore. Like I said in the beginning, when you take an action immediately, that will prevent you cargo shift and thereafter you have the collision that probably you are a tanker fully loaded with fuel and you have the collision with another vessel fully loaded with fuel. That means from cargo shift, you move to uh, so check the traffic density. How many vessels do you have around you? What are, what are their feet? What, what uh, steel room do you have to maneuver? You check all that everywhere. What is the sweat? What is the current? Do you have a, a strong wind? All those things are very important for you. So they, when you see, when you are able to ascertain the traffic density around, you can know how you are going to maneuver the vessel to a safe place. If you have every weather, you know the idea you are going to make so that the weather will be, will, will be an advantage to you. You are going to consider that. Thereafter, you move to assessment. Danger of surprising or flooding. So, number one, risk and uh, uh, investigate cause to extend of ship. What caused the ship? Is the ship is the ship due to uh, excessive rolling of the vessel? Is it due to uh, is, is it due due to parametric uh, rolling? Is it you need to check what caused that? If you are carrying grain, you need to check. Is it due to grain shift? You need to check all that. So what extent are 
as the uh, uh, cargo shifted, you need to consider that what causes and what extent. If you have checked this, you also need to check for the in a, in a stable condition, and you also need to confirm if this is due to angle of load or lift. So at that moment that the cargo has shifted, you need to know if they are still, if you are lifting or, or the vessel has uh, got into an angle of load. You need to know that and you need to know the cost and extent of the lift or load so that you know how to correct it. If you don't know if it is the angle of load or lift and you start moving cargo, you might end up adding more salt to the engine. So you need to ascertain if the vessel is listed or the vessel is at load, so as to know the action that you're going to take next. So we'll move on to contingency action. If we, when you are done with your assessment to know what causes the uh, cargo shifting, to what extent has the cargo shifted, what is, the, what is the result into, is it lift or load? When you know all this, then you know all the load or the stream. If the vessel is listed, I expect us to try to balance the vessel. If it is low, at the same time, depending on where, it is, where the angle of load is, if you load to the starboard side and you have double bottom tank, I expect you to start loading the double bottom from the side that you uh, listed load to. If it's starboard side, start loading, loading from that side to correct the load to increase your G. So when your G goes up, then gradually the negative GM will be eradicated. Number two, consider jettison of cargo if the situation is uncontrollable. In a situation whereby you see that even balancing might not work, and you are still listed to one side, to several side, for example, you have to, we might consider jettison some cargoes from the starboard side so as to bring up the vessel. You can also do what? Close all water side doors, water side doors and weather, weather side uh, doors. That is close all water side and weather, weather side operation. Definitely this has been done during your initial action. All water side and weather, weather side doors have to be shut during your initial action. So that if there is any ingress of water, the ingress of water will not go beyond the compartment that is being, uh, uh, that the compartment that the water is. So another thing you need to do during your contingency action is to secure the cargo using all available needs. Carrying the cargo using our available means. If you are carrying containers, I believe during the uh, shifting of cargo, a lot of latches would have been and uh, would, would have been compromised. So I expect us to do what to try and latch as much cargo as we can, so that more cargo do not shift. Because the more the lashing, uh, the, the, the lashing equipment are loose, the more the cargoes you want to shift to that side that the vessel is listed. So we need to go back, reassess, and check if our lashing equipment, if our cargoes are properly lashed. If not, we need to reinforce the lashing so that more cargoes will not shift. And also, we need to determine any leakage of fire or dangerous goods. If the vessel is loaded with 
dangerous group, we need to check for leakage. Check if none of them is leaking. And also uh, 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 explosive and cargo. We try to make sure that we don't have fire. Like what I said in, from the beginning, when you have an emergency, try not to create another one. Try to minimize the emergency you have at that moment and fight it to the end. Creating another one is a big mess. You having cargo shifting and at the same time moving to fire. You are not even done with the cargo shifting. So we try to fight whatsoever incident or emergency we have to prevent it from advising, uh, advancing into another one. So the request for assistance is required. You can request for assistance from other vessels around. You can request assistance for tow. You can request assistance for, for towing, yeah, for tow around. If you have tow around you, you can request for, for them. I believe they will want to move in into salvage. Yes, you can request for it to preserve the lives of the vessel, the cargo, and the crew on board. So you can request for assistance immediately if it is needed. And also you can consider proceeding to the next port of refuge or anchorage. If you see that you cannot correct the angle of load or lift, maintain that and move to the closest port of refuge or anchorage, save anchorage around you so that you can proceed there for safety rather than remaining at sea and creating uh, more incident for yourself. So moving to informing action. After contingencies have been considered, investigations have been done, I expect us to do what to inform our company. You remember I said my company, we usually have a flash. We send a flash in an incident after. After the contingency plan assessment has been done, we can now go on and do a proper incident report. What happened? What have you done? What do you expect the company to do for you? The next action that you're going to do is to consider going to the next uh, port of refuge. You will put it that you put that in your uh, in your incident report and send to the company. You also need to inform your charter. Very very important. You inform your charters, tell them what happened, incidents, and uh, action taking, and next thing that you are going to do, inform your charter, inform P and the, the uh, port of refuge. You are not going to make, um, you are not going to, that means you might not complete your voyage. If you send charter, that means you, you might not arrive as that when you, which is your, let's assume you get to some cargo as well, you need to inform your PI so that you, you consider how the loss is going to be shared, who is going to pay, and everything. So you inform the PI also you inform the classification to, uh, society, definitely. Definitely only the captain can do that. The captain will inform the classification society and also inform your plastic. And there is something I omitted during the contingency plan. If you are close to shore, you might consider vision. Very important. If you are not deep at sea, if you are in the coastal state, you might consider vision immediately. At least when the vessel is far to shore, after Fishing, you drop the anchor and remain there. Try to see what you can do. Okay. Uh, our next incident uh, or emergency is dangerous goods incident. Your vessel carries IMDG goods. There is possibility 
of you having, yes, you might follow the, the, the code, you might follow everything, the segregation, you might follow it. But that does not stop incidents from happening. Some things can cause the dangerous goods, like you having uh, explosives. Something might happen, and one of the explosives explodes. Also, you might be carrying uh, oxidizing agents, and it, can, it might oxidize. So anything can happen. It's like we offshore versus we do carry explosives, and we do carry uh material so anything can happen the radioactive might leak probably one of the guys on the deck wore his uh, radioactive jacket and tried to see and went with the emitter to see how far with the cargo on getting there he noticed that from the meter that there is a leakage from the radioactive uh, so immediately you have a dangerous good incident on board. So actions to be taken. The first thing that we do, just like what I said, we have actions to be taken, which are initial action or immediate action, followed by investigating, investigation and contingency, then for informing action. So in this case, I respect the man the crew who observed this to raise action, is to raise alarm immediately. You raising alarm, you, that means you inform everybody on board and everybody will be aware. So even if everybody is not aware, the man on watch will be aware. Thereafter, he's going to monitor all, all crew, check for the missing or injured persons on board, which is key. Then send out an urgency message to the vessels in the vicinity, letting them know that you have a dangerous good incident on board so they can keep clear of you. And uh, close all water side doors and fire doors immediately. Close all vents, fire flaps, fans connecting to that area. If you have a leakage of uh, uh radioactive source i expect us to shut all ventilation everybody move inside in as much all ventilation all fires everything is shut down the radioactive source will not penetrate down to the accommodation we must have that location of wind of incident this is to prevent the Radioactive source to be taken up by the wind to the vessel. So mostly, as soon as this happens, I expect the man on 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 the steering to utter force immediately and pull the vessel up with, so that the vessel will, the the accommodation area will be clear from wind, so that the wind will not bring will not bring the uh, radio practice us towards the accommodation. So another thing we need to consider is logging. I did not mention it in the first uh, incident. Logging of all events. When the PLI comes on board, when the charter come on board, they will request for your log and they will want you to give them into to how the incident happened. So Keeping of blood very, very key. I could remember the incident I have on board my vessel during my last pitch. Immediately, the, uh, immediately the master came on board, police came on board, they requested for my log, my deck log. Thank God everything was in total. If anything was missing, then they will suspect. That guy, what happened? But the visitor club was fine. Actually, he came to me to in, from my sister vessel. He came to my vessel to take some medication. The captain was aware, and I was aware that I was coming. 
I was the one who administered the drugs to him myself. Said he had cough, and I gave him, I gave him everything, and everything was documented. So when I said login, I'm not talking about the deck log or the uh, big log alone. Every information that has to do with the information with the incident should be logged. Thank God he signed the uh, medical log. If had, he had not signed the medical log of the incident, because the first question was, what did he came to do on my vessel? Uh, I said, he came for medication. Everything is away. OK. Where is the resource log? I brought it out. Where is the medical log? It was clearly signed. His name, the medication I gave to him, what happened to him? So you can all see the importance of keeping log of all events. I never knew if that would happen that night. I never knew. So apart from having emergencies, I will employ us to be good students. All activities on board should be properly logged. We don't know when we need it. So let's talk uh, about emergencies. You know, this is just general bookkeeping on board. You must keep proper log of all events on board. It might be needed at any time. It might be after two, three weeks. You don't know. They just saw you. A captain, can you supply us with this uh, information? And unfortunately, you can't. So that's our incident. Uh, Imagine so commence logging of all sequence of events very important. Thereafter, you go for the further initial action. Make an initial report to the company, like my company, the flash, display AUC signal, start pump, fire pump on standby in case the dangerous group incident might result into fire outbreak. Then you move on to the assessment and investigation action. So number one, you confirm the vessel's position considering one, traffic density, every weather, proximity to shore, and closeness to dangerous areas. Like the initial, uh, the, uh, the previous incident. You check the traffic density, how close are you to other vessels? How many vessels are you, are you in the anchorage? Are you in the uh, CSS? Are you in the street? You need to consider all that so that you know how to make your maneuvering. Number two, every weather. Are you in every 50 plus, 40, 50 knots? You consider that proximity to shore. That for you to consider if you are going to beach the vessel. So if you are very close to shore, if, in the coast, if you are in the coastal state, coastal area, you might consider beaching. And also, are you close to an hazard? Are you close to, to a wreck? Are you close to, like for us working in the offshore industry, are you close to a jacket? Are you close to an offshore installation? You need to consider all that. And you make quick invest. You quickly investigate which dangerous goods are involved. If you have more than one dangerous goods on board, you need to quickly know which of the dangerous goods is affected. Is it the explosive? Is it, is it the oxidizing agent? Is it the is, is, is it the radioactive? Uh, Cargo, you need to check it immediately. Get to know what, what cargo is involved. You quickly consult the EMS, which is the emergency proceed guide. Associated with the specific card, cargo village and fire. So immediately you know the kind of 
IMDG that is affected. You consult the EMS so that you know the specific actions to be taken in case of fire, in case of spillage. And then you can act according to what you get from the EMS. And also, you need to consider the first aid equipment that will be used. In case if you need medical attention, you need to have your first aid equipment on standby. And I expect us to do what to quickly assess the risk, whether it is safe for cargo to enter with the. So I will talk more on that. If you have a leakage from your radioactive source, I believe for you to carry the radioactive source, you will have on board uh, the uh, meter to read how much stuff has been emitted. And also you have the disk, the radio radioactive disk. You also have re radioactive jacket that can be worn. So if you are very sure that is a radioactive uh, cargo that is being that is being affected for your crew to go there definitely the crew must have its radioactive disc within where is radioactive jacket and also have within the meter so as to read how many how much of the cargo has been emitted when Unfortunately, if your cab, if your vessel don't have such, I don't expect you to risk the life of your crew. So that is where quick assessment to know whether it is safe for your crew to enter affected area, and also determine any leakage of dangerous goods and isolate immediate. So if you are able to know how much your radioactive source has. Uh, as leak, you try as much as possible to isolate it immediately. Determine the source. Yes, you need to know exactly which cargo, exactly which of the IMDG is leaking. So when all this is done, you can now move on. When you are done with your investigation, to know exactly what happened. You can now move on to your confidence, which is what are you going to do? Number one, firefighting and control stroke, remove uh, spillage in accordance to the EMS guidelines. In this case, you need to still consult the EMS to know how you are going to fight the fire. So know how you are going to remove the spillage. What can be used? What chemical can be used? Or if it is something you can use, what if it is a cargo that you can use water? I don't expect you to use water on an oxidizing agent. So when you consult the EMS, the EMS will tell you what you can use to to to, to fight the fire one. And if it is not fire spillage, what you can use to move the, to, to clean the spillage away. And uh, if only the crew can be sent, you need to know if only the crew can be sent, or you need to send uh, trained personnel. That was the time my vessel uh, carried this uh, ISO tank where we have different type, type of chemicals. So while on board, we usually have those guys for the chemicals on board. So my crew don't go near it. The guys, they call themselves uh, chemical engineers. They are on board with us. So if you have this kind of, during that period, if I have that, this, uh, this kind of emergency, I don't expect my crew to fight the emergency. These guys are being trained to handle such emergency. So you need to consider that if you are going to send your crew or you send the trained personnel for this kind of emergency. 
you have to consider secure the cargo using all available means. If it is flashing, you lash it properly. All available means on board you use to secure it. Determine leakage of the dangerous goods. That has been done, that has been considered during the investigative period. You know which of the cargo is leaking. You can also consider jettisoning the cargo if the situation is out of control. If the let's assume the uh, the, car, the cargo is going to explode, is an explosive to send it to the boat, rather than exploding my vessel, my crew, and every other cargo on board, I might decide to jettison the cargo if it's going to explode in the water. Fine, Pia and I will account for that. So. <clears throat> We can also do what, when all this has been done, then we can consider if vessel can resume the voyage safely. So, have you been able to fight the, uh, if it is fire, have you been able to fight the fire with the spillage? Have you been able to contain the spillage properly? Have you been able to, to, to have you been, able to reduce the emission of the of the cargo according to EMS have you been able to do all necessary things to be done if all this has been considered then you can consider if you need to continue your voyage or you need to proceed to port of refuge or an anchorage like I said if your vessel is close to shore you can consider vision. So if you are unable to fight the fire, if you are unable to contain the spillage, according to the EMS guidelines, you might consider you might you might consider going to a safe port, which is a port of refuge or safe anchorage. Also. You can ask for immediate assistance from other vessels around you to assist you. Then finally, informative, uh, informing action. Like the previous Happy, please. incident. Happy, please, sir. I have owners, a question, sir. Letting them know. OK, go ahead, please. OK, sir. Uh, uh, in case of fire, I, I am asking uh, what, uh, at what angle or at what extent or how, how advisable does it, is it for me to request a talk? Because you said I can request a talk and I am thinking of myself that if I am, as my vessel is on fire and I can still request a talk, uh, as in how advisable is that? in which my vessel would not affect the talk in which I'm requesting. So I really don't know if my question is being cleared and you can just give me a, a guideline, sir. All I'm trying to okay. get to know now is when can I request a talk? Okay. Number one, that the talk is also a city talk. Because you are on fire and you need an immediate assistance. So if you have been trying to fight the fire and you cannot extinguish the fire, then you can consider a talk. And in that case, it is not just a talk that is salvage. Do you understand? Right, sir. I'm with you. I'm getting you, sir. Are you clear enough? Are yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, In sir. that case, you are not requesting for just the talk. That is a salvage operation. So if either you are calling the storm to help fight your fire or you are calling the storm to tow you, that is if 
your machineries are broken down convenient and you cannot continue to make your way. So you can either call the storm to tow you or to use the CC. But at the same time, when the vest, when you are considering CC, you have to consider the stability of your vessel. Because the more water intake of water, if the water the, uh, the storm is going to use to fight the fire, if it's going to remain on board, you should know that your vessel stability is going to be affected. So you have to consider that as well. Clear, sir. Very clear, sir. Very clear, sir. Very clear now, sir. Any other question? Uh, Captain Fulabi, do you want to add up to what I just said? Uh, yes, sir. I will just uh, add um, that when you're requesting the, um, the talk, um, I hope you're not mistaking it for the talk coming for a towage operation. Because just like we started off by saying that there are priorities, the priority in this case uh, will not be immediately to start towing the vessel. The priority, just like Captain Joshua said, is salvage. And when, when salvage comes in, salvage is to try and salvage the situation as the terminology um, says. So it's if the vessel is, um, if there is leakage of maybe dangerous good into the water and the AMS guideline does not around so this is when they try and contain the situation if it's um explosive or fire going on but the, the toll will come but it's not to immediately start towing it's to immediately release um uh, these jets water jets and the help of sports and fighting the fire and that's why you also see in on rigs and um, fpsos and everything we have supporting investors and the supporting investors we have our jets ready to assist um offshore in fighting fire so you, when we are speaking about inviting i mean seeking assistance is the assistance is not only to the dogs the assistance can also be to other vessels but also um i want to acknowledge your points that when another vessel as per the search and rescue uh, I, I answer chapter um i answer volume chapter three when another vessel is going to rescue for instance if a tanker is going to rescue maybe a container vessel on fire, serious fire. Um, the captain will also have to consider the safety of his own um, vessel um, as well. So that is in those conditions as per solar, that's when you have to give reasons why the master cannot go to, to carry out a rescue operation. But in this case here, um, yeah, I know you're making more emphasis to talk, but the, 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 the situation for the, I mean, what the talk is needed to do is not to come in to render a towage operation, is to render, just like Captain Joshua said, a salvage operation, how can we solve this problem? Then after that, then we now look into, um, you know, um, towing the vessel. The towage really comes in grounding situation, grounding situation, whereas, um, of course, when the master really deems it fit to say, okay, I need to try and use a dog to pull out my vessel. Then, then we use a dog um, in pulling out um, the vessel as well. So yeah, no matter the situation, the 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 dog, I mean the master on the dog also has to put into consideration what's going on on this vessel. But like I said, the operation is not to come. So when you tell an examiner, you call a dog, I mean, a dog. When your vessel is on fire, you call a talk. When your vessel is on another, I mean, dangerous incident, the examiner is thinking, oh, this guy wants to just start pulling the vessel away. Why are you pulling the vessel? No, I'm calling for pressure, I mean, for situation, I mean, for other vessels to come and assist in salvage operation and putting this situation under the content. Yeah. Thank you, Captain Apolabi. I think uh, you are clear enough now. Yeah, very clear, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, okay. All right, brother. So we are still on the dangerous goods incident. So you inform the owner about what happened, what you have done. This is mostly through their report and uh, inform the chatterers about the incident, inform P and I 
we form the classification society, and finally we form the MEIB. So we've come to the end of the of today's lab. So any question from the app? Uh, All the incidents with uh, classes, contingency classes, one, two, three. Thanks, boss. Uh, this is Tyre here. Right. Um, I would like to add one or two things, a uh, quick one. Um, I, I, um, I remember there was a time the uh, container vessel, I, no, a Roro vessel was beached in some one of the ports in Southampton. The pilot was on the way out with the vessel and she lost her stability. I think they were going to an angle of low or something happened. Uh, to save the vessel from sinking and you know capsizing and all that for 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 or further damage, the pilot decided to just uh, take it aground, you know, beach it so that uh, you know they can save it. At least when they sort themselves, they can drag it out, or else the whole thing will capsize. I also would like to add that, um, uh, of course, we are on board. We are not an island of knowledge. Uh, once we send our initial um, information to our office. Uh, they will. They, they, the office should have the team that will support the master uh, in what we should do, like our damage stability. If we require to do that, you know, there are some calculations that will be done off the, uh, the office side, uh, maybe with the naval architect and all that. That will be passed to the vessel. So um, we should get support if we need support from the office. Uh, I, I'm sure they will be calling anyway. Uh, but we should work with uh, with office um, personnel and the class, the PNIs. Most of them also have um, a dedicated team to, in case of emergency, to advise the master on what to to do. So those things are also always available during any contingency. So we should have it in mind. Examiners would like to know that we we are aware of these facilities. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it shows confidence as well. So we are not an island of, yeah, we're an island on the ship, but not of knowledge. So we should leverage on um, other, other people, even the flag states. Uh, a lot of the examiners or the surveyors I experienced, uh, they've probably seen one of these things before. So they too can chip in and say, okay, this is what we, we suggest and all that. So all these people are always available for our help. And to contact them, especially for like IOPB pollution, don't forget your uh, people should not forget the what's it called now the list of uh, there's a list of nationalities and the contacts. So all these contacts are things that we should have and know where they are. Our um, admiralty radio signals are all the list of uh, contact the emergency contacts that we have on our ships for the offices. This thing should be ready readily available as well. It's not when you have emergency, you start thinking, who am I going to call? What's the telephone number of the DPA? Uh, you know, and all that. So all these things should be on our fingertips as uh, responsible officers so that we can easily activate them. So emergencies do happen with our best preparation, our best toolbox talk, our best risk assessment. They do happen. Uh, it takes a bit of experience. Uh, when you have an accident first time, you might not be able to sleep for maybe for two, three days. We don't pray for it. But when you have an accident, you get more experience. And, uh, you know, so the, working on the ship is a team, uh, the team effort to, to how to respond to the accident, as Captain Joshua said, so that it doesn't escalate, you know, to another, the bigger issue, all right? So, guys, please have that at the back of your mind. Everything you do on board and the people in the office, they would also, be, there's a team there, there's a technical department, the operation department, inform them as soon as possible, they will be able to help as well. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much, Cap. Oh, okay. yeah. That is a great one for me. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Captain Joshua. Um, this was really a very um, interesting um, class. And I really learned a lot as well as everybody here. So it's now an open floor. Um, 
from emergency one, two, three, four. And um, if I look properly, uh, we studied how many emergencies? Uh, just one second, I want to get this number right. Yeah, nine, I mean, eight emergencies. And like, I, like when we started the uh, emergencies, we said, it is not a set and stone. We are not giving you, this is the exact answer that you need to give to the examiners. But feedbacks from examiners, even feedbacks from practical ways of doing things have really shown that at least there should be a structure to your answers when delivering, uh, when giving your answers, when delivering your presentation, when it comes to um, emergencies. So first, it still carries on if you see the old flow. It's your initial action. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when you see a man overboard? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you see fire? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when there's a collision? What's the first thing that comes to your mind when there's grounding? The first thing that should come to your mind when there's grounding should not be going to lock on the lock in the logbook. It's very important for you to go and log in the logbook. The first thing that comes to your mind when there's grounding is not for you to go and be sounding tanks. The first thing that comes to your mind when there's fire is not to go and start reporting to MAIB or whatever. But there should be first thing that comes to your mind, second thing that comes to your mind, third thing that comes to your mind. Put yourself on the vessel. What will you initially do? Because the examiner wants to see how composed you are when you have not gotten to that emergency situation. And that kind of helps to determine what will happen when you are in that situation. Um, we have quite a just few um, little times, so I'm not going to say too much. Does anybody have any question from the whole emergencies that, um, that we've dealt with? And I will put the whole notes of emergencies right here so we can practice, we can see the um, integrities of it. Does anybody have any question? Um, fire, abandoned ship, oil pollution, cargo shift, um, man overboard. Kapi, uh, well done, sir. Yeah, my, my, my question, my question now is, uh, let's imagine a situation where like we have a heavy uh, container ship. Like, let's just say uh, in, in when uh, at that situation, around those vicinity, as in the, around the vicinity, or we have uh, uh, cargo ships. And then I have a situation of fire on board another cargo ship as in of bigger tonnage. How exactly or how, uh, how exactly does uh, those cargo ship like try to rescue the other cargo ship that is on fire? Or because I feel they are larger vessels and they are, they are big in tonnage. How exactly then do I have uh, a rescue team who can assist uh, in support of fires in quenching my fire? Mm. You get my question, sir? I'm still trying to catch the question, well, Captain Joshua, I want to jump in uh, there. All I'm trying to say is, I'm trying to describe it all because yes, of the sizes. I try to understand the question. I get your question. There are things you consider during uh, the rescue operation. Okay, an example. Oh, was it example of your container? I'll give an example of container ship and fire. Then you being a tanker loaded with fuel, trying to go and rescue. You need to consider your truck, your vessel truck, before considering the other vessel. So there are some criteria that you need to consider for you to go for a rescue mission, a search and rescue. Okay. 
with your vessel, compatible eyes of the vessel, the equipment you have on board, the experience of the of the crew on board, and also the type of cargo you carry. So you need to consider all, all that before you consider that you want to go to a rescue mission. So you being a vessel of 450 or 400 meter length of vessel, and a vessel of 300 or less is on fire. You cannot risk your vessel to go and rescue such kind of vessel. You cannot. A prudent captain will not consider that at all. The only thing you can do is to be around, and you can also help relay the distress uh, uh, alert to other vessels around. You can stay around the vessel so that you stay there spending the time other vessels will come around. Yes, you can. But when you, as a captain, when you do your proper risk assessment, you will be able to ascertain if you can help. And if you cannot help, there is no law that says that you have to put your vessel in danger for you to help another vessel. No. So just do your risk assessment and be sure if your vessel can assist. And if your vessel cannot assist, it's better to consider pushing the uh, pushing it to another vessel. Captain Afalabi. Uh, I think I'll allow Captain Tayo um, All right, guys. Um, so uh, my least experience, I've with I have had to my vessel or vessel I've been on, I've done. We've gone to support in a man overboard uh, scenario. Uh, we did search for about, I think, 52 hours. We didn't see the guy anyway, but we've been part of that. Um, my, one of my vessels has also been in charge. Um, we've been part of a rescue operation of the vessel that was sinking, where we had to save uh, the crew. And I also know that we've also done been, sta been on standby for a, rig, a offshore rig vessel that is on fire was actually on fire real life. Uh, uh, so a uh, few things I would say. So as Captain Joshua said, what, what's you, you, if you're a passenger ship and you see a vessel on fire, do you want to risk your, your crew or your passenger or your cargo for something like that? Probably the answer is gonna be no. However, um, you could be a mile away or two miles away and because you have a lot of uh, LSAs and FFAs, so just imagine the Titanic, let's go back to Titanic, 1912. There was a vessel, I think there's a Britannic uh, that was in the area or sailed in the area that was able to pick a lot of the people and they had more uh, of the, 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 what's it called, blankets and all that, so PPE. So yes, we, by law, by solar's rule, we should help. Uh, to survival uh, for if there's a distress and we can help, we should help. We can call our office, let them know. In short, you will receive a call from the Coast Guard if you're in the area and they will command your vessel to go. You must have good reasons for not going and you, everything you're going to do must be logged. Also, don't forget in your GMDSS, uh, if you receive a distress message on your GMDSS equipment, you should inform the master. And if the master decides not to go, you should be logged uh, in your GMDS logbook. It's part of the requirement. So you, you have to follow like what Captain just said, do a use assessment of your own vessel uh, and see what you can do. But you can be of help. You can relay the message. You can become uh, the mothership basically of the communication. You, 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 know, you can take charge of the communication. You can send smaller craft you are big enough, maybe your hospital is bigger, you have more equipment. The smaller vessels that can go might not have the equipment. Uh, they can use their line train appliances and they can send you a mooring line which can be 200 meters away. And you can just attach the mooring line to somewhere in your ship and tow them to safety. You know, it's not something dramatic. And you, you could just be there in case they're going to abandon the ship at the end of the day. Uh, your rescue boats could pick them up from their lifeboats. So all these things are uh, considered help. Uh, if you could salvage, yeah, maybe lucky for you, yourself and your crew could decide to share the bounty. I didn't have that experience at sea, 
Uh, I think I missed that one. And probably any, any of you guys might be able to, when you get it, send uh, some fight and offering to the mountain. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank, thank you very much. Uh, that was um, insightful. Um, I think Captain Bayo and Captain Joshua um, has answered the question as to which vessels we will, we will need to come and um, carry out the rescue operation. In matter of that, also, I also put in the maneuver characteristics, especially um, of the vessel. Just like Captain Joshua said, you just imagine a whole big um, LNG and someone is right there overboard in um, maybe Bonny Channel or so. What maneuver characteristics if you see LNG and then you see a very little top boat, which two vessels will you be able to quickly choose and say you're going to maneuver? So all these things we put into consideration when you are considering, considering your uh, search and rescue as per I am sir, voluntary. Um, yeah, I hope that has answered and clarified uh, the question um, as well. Does anybody have any other question um, in the group? Okay, with that, um, just one more thing I want to say. We, we spoke today twice about jettisoning um, cargo. Um, I can imagine me myself. Um, I have a cargo on board Captain Joshua's vessel, and then Captain Joshua, for one, some reason, just see my own cargo. Is it I'm going to lose the whole money? Does anybody know what will happen um, that the master is to do? This is for Chief Meta Master, by the way, um, to do if Captain Joshua just see my, my container on the IC. Now fight, though. Ah, nah, nah, <laughs> fight. We go start fight. Sharp, sharp. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be another interesting topic. Um, in if not the if not um if not the next class, um, um, a class after that, and that's when we are coming into. Let's come into my time law, and I have I have a lawyer in the house here. Um, he's a captain. He's a lawyer. And thank God is the one fighting. <laughs> so we're gonna be speaking about that. Uh, what happens? Am, am I going to lose? Um, but this is a very, very uh, interesting topic, and it's a very important uh, topic uh, as well. So with that, um, boy, for those who want to go find out and read about it, it's called general average. So general average also will be a very important class that we'll be talking about. I will look forward to to uh, meeting one of our captains to take us on general average um, very soon. So it's really something that we all should, if you want to read about it and then bring your questions in on, on what to say general average is. Then after the general average will be, we are talking of salvage. So also we'll be looking at storage and salvage um, as well as, as the time um, goes on. Uh, with that, I'll say thanks to everyone it's been a lovely tuesday and see you um next week on the on the 27th thank you thank you and those that are doing their orals please once you finish send us the oral report so send it to us so that we can know the type of questions the examiners are asking and we can use that to prepare or help other people to prepare uh captain benson i see you thank you so much for coming sir thank you everybody goodbye uh, thank you, Captain Joshua. We are really very, very grateful. Uh, no worries, we are bringing the offerings to you, sir. We are gathering them. <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> Thanks very much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Um, bye, everyone. I'll see you again. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Okay.